Thank you guys. I have prepared some note cards because I tend to digress constantly and I'm going to try to keep myself on the path here tonight. Um, first off, I'd like to explain what a poetry slam is. Does anybody here know what a slam is? I've got a couple of people. Um, so a poetry slam is essentially a game. Very simple rules. It's a forum for all types of voices. It's an open forum. Anybody can come to a slam and sign up. Anybody can be a judge. Anybody can participate in a number of different ways. The simple rules are it's only original work. You have three minutes to tell your story. You have no props or music. Judges are selected randomly from the audience, and they assign scores to people suffering, essentially. That's one of my favorite ways to put it. People spill their hearts and souls on stage, and you assign a numerical value to their experience. <laughs> it's exactly that ridiculous. <laughs> but it connects people. One of the questions that I've always gotten in the eight or nine years that I've been doing this is why poetry? And especially from people who have seen me or seen my work in other formats, they want to know why I would keep beating the poetry drum in a field where kind of the greatest success is to be almost unsuccessful. So I used to have no answer to that question, why poetry? I'd usually say, uh. Uh, and gradually, I started to learn that one of my reasons that I've always loved poetry so much is that it is indefinable. I've heard a million different definitions of what makes poetry poetry. Some people say it's writing feelings more than writing words. Some people say that it's writing the unwritable. And my favorite definition is sort of a twist on a Marshall McLuhan quote, which is usually attributed to Andy Warhol, that art is anything that you can get away with, which is what I believe of poetry. Poetry should be anything that you can get away with. That kind of proves true if you look up poetry in Webster's Dictionary, because Webster says poetry is metrical writing. All writing is metrical. All writing has rhythm. Anything you've ever read has rhythm. It's just a matter of how you present it. Because poetry is indefinable, we get freedom from that. Freedom from definition gives you freedom in your passions. We all here who are speaking have refused to let classical definitions of what fields we work in or what things we want to do stand in our way. And I've never been a big fan of classical definitions. You see, definitions are these immovable, static things. And I don't like immovable, static things. I like things that can change and grow and develop over time. So I prefer to approach poetry with a system of beliefs. Belief number one, poetry is necessary. Poetry is accessible to anyone and everyone. And when we see someone perform a poem, or when we read a poem on page, we get to look at our lives through the eyes of another person. We get to look at the world that we live in through someone else's experience. My second belief, everyone has a story that someone else needs to hear. Last summer, this is kind of a weird story. OK. <laughs> Last summer, we were sending our first team to National Poetry Slam from Las Vegas in over six years. I was really psyched for it. We had done all this paperwork. We had worked so hard to get there. I was super ready to go. And about a month before we went to Nationals, stuff in my personal life went kind of crazy. I'm adopted. And for a long time, I believed that my biological mother was dead. About a month before Nationals, I had two of her daughters add me on Facebook. Really threw me off, put me in a weird place going to Nationals. When I got there, there was a gentleman from New York City who did a poem about his biological mother seeking him out recently. And there was no way when he went up on that stage that he could have known anyone was going through a similar experience. Granted, there are the universal aspects that he could know that people would relate to. That disconnection, that idea of wanting to get back with somebody that you had some connection to, and that sort of tearing idea of whether you would take that step or not. He performed that poem, and I had sort of this reaction. At first, I was like, 
cool. And then at the end of it, total spit take, and I'm weeping in the audience. And my third belief, which I don't actually have a slide for, because it seems like one of the themes this week is screw the deck. Uh, <laughs> my third belief is all poems are an attempt to change the world. It might be an attempt to change the poet's own world. It might be an attempt to change the listener's world. Or in some cases, it's an attempt to start a full-on revolution. Some people want to just throw the fist up and say, let's change everything right now. And that's, that's fine. That's not, that's not normally my style, but to each their own. Um, so I decided I was going to share a poem with you guys tonight as part of my presentation. And uh, it's a piece that I wrote last summer before all the crazy stuff happened um, in response to a series of tweets that I saw come through my feed. And it was a DJ in a local club posting his receipt for his drinks, which were $2,000 bottles of champagne, and a little placard that was on the table that read $50,000 minimum. So this is a poem called, oh, nope, there we go. <laughs> I switched my order. Um, so this is a poem called, To the DJ Popping $2,000 Bottles of Champagne in the Club. <laughs> There's a man in the parking lot using a tire stop for a pillow. You missed him. They spit shine the valet sidewalks. Even inside, they pharaoh's servants you right to your table, fluff your pillows, and never even raise a hand to imply a tip. The funny thing about clubs, Mr. DJ, is the number of mirrors. Only the self-conscious or self-loathing could need that much reminder that people are witnessing their 45 minutes of trying on before they decided who to be tonight, and you sit at a table where minimum expense is more than most teachers will ever earn in a year and a half. Each bottle you pop could bring water to four villages with only dirty wells, and I am trying to be happy for you that you can gladly pay $2,000 a bottle for champagne and not cry over spilled villages, I'm trying to convince myself that somehow this is how you make good on all of those promises you broke to yourself as you grew from an idealist child to a jaded, overpaid jerkwad. I'm trying to convince myself or I'm red crossing my heart for the secret of how much relief your VIP status could provide in a disaster zone if you weren't so busy filleting your own ego for everyone to see how paid you are, how easily you forget whatever stresses weigh them into walking messes of blisters pus popping on the dance floor, how easily we forget our broken motherlands as we nestle our bodies inside of their cement chests and forget about those for whom this same substance is a final pillow. Your eyeballs? They're fish hooks, Mr. DJ, and their eyeballs are bobbers. You know if they stop looking, you will sink, become just another tomb with only a hidden entrance. Wouldn't want that time so expensive spent into the image flickering back when the house lights start cocaine convulsing. Wouldn't want to risk stopping to remember how many lives you are not making a difference to. Just pop another bottle. See, those villagers... They need water less than you need to be envied. After all, it's not like you're hurting anyone. So, for, uh, for that poem, I wanted to kind of give you how I feel that fits into those three beliefs about poetry. I feel that poem's necessary because it shines light on how easy it is to get caught up in glamour and to forget to help each other. The idea that someone needed to hear that story. Strangely enough, when I've read that in different venues, the people who have the most positive reactions are bartenders. <laughs> Always freaks me out. I've never been able to pin down why they love it, but they're usually the ones who go, yeah, screw those people. <laughs> and it, changing worlds. It changed my own world and made me think a lot more about how I try to give back, which I've also taken more into my organizing with the Poetry Slam and other poetry events around town. And also, it, it caused a friend of mine who was planning a big VIP bottle service blowout for his birthday to take half the money he was going to spend on that and instead give it to the Hunger Project. 
Sometimes all it takes is the right set of words at the right time to change someone's mind completely. That's what poetry is capable of. Just through the simple act of telling your story, through telling your experience in your perspective. So, what was that slide I skipped? Oh yes, this is my charge to you. Live your poetry. Find the rhythms of your life. Find those emotions inside of yourself. Don't be afraid to express yourself in those kinds of ways. Don't be afraid to be vulnerable. Put yourself out there. It can be more rewarding than you can ever realize. Follow your passions without any regard for classical definitions of what you want to do or why you believe what you do. And you can do no wrong. If there is no definition, there's no incorrect answer. Share your stories readily at all times. Sometimes, even write down one of your experiences. Write down something bad that happened to you and write how you got through it. Just leave it on a table, your local cafe, a local bookshop, stick it into a book that somebody might pick up and take home someday. Maybe they'll need that story. It was a project we used to do when I lived in Arizona that we would do this every summer. There's a thing called found poetry where you find something that just seems like a poem. Everybody's familiar with the, the William Carlos Williams poem about the plums. That's a found poem from a post-it note on a fridge. We called this lost poetry. Just writing a poem, losing it somewhere, and hoping that somebody might pick it up and need it. And in every day, Try to live a world-changing story. Even if you're only changing your own world day to day, it's important to make sure that we don't stagnate. You can't let yourself just be still. Keep moving, keep trying, and even if you're gonna change worlds one at a time, still change them. Thank you, guys. And uh, for our Q&A portion, I wanted to bring up one of my co-organizers, Carrie O'Connor. She is our regular host at the Battleborn Slam, and she's been doing this for even longer than I have, so she's a great resource. Carrie, do you want a mic? Oh, there you go. Hi. Oh, 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 oh hi. <laughs> okay, so questions. When is the next local poetry slam? Um, our local poetry slams, we have slams every first and third Wednesday at Yayo Taco, the locally owned taco shop down by the university. And we also have the full chicken slam that happens at the Double Down on the second Wednesdays. So the first three Wednesdays of the month, you can always find a poetry slam. And there are other poetry events in town every night of the week, essentially. Yes. If people wanted to learn more about slam poetry or like just watch other great slam poets, is there a website or a place online? Um, generally, I'd recommend going to YouTube. I actually have a huge playlist on there that includes a bunch of my favorite poems. Um, I recently gave someone the recommendation, just go search Ken Arkind and go from there. He's one of my favorite poets. There's a performance from him at uh, TED Denver Talk, where he performs his piece in Experiment in Noise in A-sharp major. And it's an incredible and inspiring poem. And from there, you can find tons of links to get through. You can also find me on Facebook. Facebook or hit me up on Twitter and I can provide you a link to that list of poetry videos that I that I have. And if you want to see local poets, we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Las Vegas Slam. Okay. Um, have you ever given a poem that has uh, stirred someone up in the audience that, have made, that has made them extremely angry at you or was that full of <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> My favorite performance that I've ever done, I actually got, we score on a scale of 0 to 10, Olympic style, and I got a 2.7 and three tens. And the person who gave me the 2.7 made sure to find me when we took our break and berate me extensively. So, you know, it, it showed that it was affecting people, that people were reacting. And to me, that's more valuable than that it pissed somebody off. <laughs> Sorry, guys, that was the last question. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right, thank you, guys.